Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, we are so thankful to have you with us. And gratitude is so important these days. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, eyes on the pies. The pie hole has a special Thanksgiving menu. And how about a chocolate turkey apple to decorate your table? But first, how Canada gave one Vancouver man a second chance at life by giving him a new set of ears. It's okay to, to be unique. Um, I didn't ask for this life. I didn't ask to be deaf and hard of hearing. I didn't ask to have no ears growing up. I didn't ask to be to have to wear prosthetics. But you know, I, I wish you know growing up people could have told me that um, you know what, it's it's okay to be you, um, live out your life. You are watching an excerpt from season two of the CBC documentary series You Can't Ask That. It's aimed at confronting prejudices and breaking down taboos about people with different disabilities. Well, all the episodes are now streamable on CBC Gem. And Vancouver's Yat Lee is part of the series. Yat, hi, how are you? Um, well, um, things are going really well. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you, Gloria. Good. Now, tell us, what condition were you born with? I was born with a condition called microtia. Microtia is when the outer ears are much smaller. It usually affects one to about 50,000 live births, and it ranges from different levels, from one to level four being very severe. Um, for, my, for me, my condition is very severe, level four. And usually it affects one side, but it seems like I, I won the lottery at birth, and it affected both my ears. And I have profound hearing loss as well. So not only did I uh, was born with a physical disability, but I also had a profound hearing loss as well. So what was that like? I mean, your early life in Hong Kong where you were born. Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, it was certainly very tough. I remember um, not too long ago when my mother uh, reviewed kind of the history of when I was first born, she said she cried for a full month after learning that her son, myself, was born deaf and hard of hearing and also had a cleft palate and a lip and also being um, physically different. So it was very challenging. In an Asian culture where um, physical appearance is at its forefront and very important, um, I was often kind of held back. I was never included in any group settings. Uh, in fact, mainstream schools did not admit me to in Hong Kong. So my parents were very, um, uh, were young parents at the time, and they were also very disappointed. So and when I was five years old, my family decided to immigrate to Vancouver, Canada. Uh, BC to give me a chance for better educational support and better health support. Well, that is good to hear. So when we talk about the health supports, what about the surgery you received when you were 12? Yes. Um, you know, growing up, um, my, my dad's workplace, um, our, the late Miss Eleni Scalpani, she really fought uh, for, for me, uh, for inclusion, and for me to get this surgery. Uh, this surgery is a bone anchored surgery, which inputs an implant behind my right ear that you see today. This allows me to use a bone conduction hearing aid that allows me to hear clearly, like I am today with you, with a Bluetooth clip. I would not have been able to act, be able to access this type of electronic, this type of device and technology, if I was anywhere else. I just felt really grateful. And the first time I wore this hearing aid, I just felt like I could hear everything, and it was just so noisy and loud. And I even told my parents the same day when I wore this type of hearing aid, I'm like, what is that sound? And they're like, these are leaves rustling. And, and there was tears to their eyes that their son, who could not, not hear previously, as well as others, be able to hear minute details in their day to day. So that was a life changing moment. Wow. I could just imagine, I'm starting to get a little bit teary just thinking about how, how much of a difference that would have made in your life. So, I mean, what about your school life then, from, from then on, post-surgery? Yeah, so, you know, post-surgery, you know, post after I had the bone conduction hearing aid, I still have not been able to treat my condition, which is microtia. So my physical deformity 
and my small earlobes uh, were still present. So I was a, a target for bullying. I was a victim. Um, it was an easy target for, for others. I also did not have any self-confidence growing up. Uh, and that's because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what my personality was going to be like. I wasn't sure what I wanted to be like when I grew up. And I wasn't sure if the reality of the workplace was the same as the school. So it was very challenging for me. Um, I was very thankful to have really great support teachers uh, that brought me up, that uh, helped me with enunciation, being, being able to pronounce uh, clearly. I had really big challenges when it came to consonants. Um, but, you know, in high school, I, I also had a, a, a thing where I had to wear a prosthetic gear, and similar to what you see today. Because when I saw my doctor, they said, son, um, I encourage you to get some prosthetics because high school would be really tough for you. Uh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry to hear you had that, that experience, really. And I guess this is a, a real learning moment for, for all of us. What, what kind of message would you like to, to get out there in terms of people encountering someone with, with a condition like yours? Um, I encourage you to be yourself and explain your situation as clearly as possible. Do not be afraid and feel empowered that you have the room you have your audience and you have your friends. And by sharing your story, you know there's going to be a lot of people that will be supporting you, that'll be rooting for you, that'll give you that support, and always never be afraid to share your condition. Well, and how does your job at the Wavefront Center for Communication Accessibility, how does that help others? You know, being able to work at Wavefront Center is marrying my loop experience and marrying it with my skills and education in communications and marketing. Wavefront Center um, aims at reducing communication barriers for those who are deaf, who are deaf blind, oral deaf, late deaf, and those who are hard of hearing. Um, I feel empowered when I work at Wavefront Center to share these stories, to share messages, and to let people know that we have uh, registered audiologists to support them. We have employment counseling for those who are looking for jobs, we have a research division and a communication devices aids department. So it is a under one roof um, uh, organization that's a nonprofit charity uh, that aims at helping people. Well, and what was it like being part of the documentary series? <laughs> you know, being able to, you know what, you know, every time you share your story, it's like peeling off a, a band-aid and your wounds are exposed and you remember those stories and, and, and trauma growing up. But I really enjoyed being part of the uh, uh, series and documentary because it gave me a chance to share my story again to a broader audience. And I hope that, you know, my sharing and being a lighthearted moment and having those moments with uh, the producer and Laura Campbell, you know, it, it felt empowering. And I'm so glad to be part of that. Yeah, you are really an inspiration. Such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. Like my story. Vancouver. Well, it's time for one of our favorite features when we get to showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. Well, hiking seems to be an activity so many of you are doing these days. Charles Hansen was at Eagle Bluffs in West Vancouver and shared a moment with a couple of crows. So lovely. Thank you, Charles. Sylvester Law was out at Deer Lake and discovered these amazing mandarin ducks. Such a burst of color there. Thank you, Sylvester. And Glenn Halverson sets the mood for the scary season with this spooky tree image taken in front of the harvest moon. Nice work there, Glenn. Thank you very much. And do send us more. It's easy. Just email your photographs to bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, Chinese people across the world have been marking the mid-autumn festival, and it wouldn't be the same without mooncakes. These traditional desserts are synonymous with the holiday, and they mark the end of the harvest season.
佢哋希望就係個彈簧就好似係、呃、代表月亮啦。咁佢哋希望就係攞個意頭就係話係一個誒團圓嘅一個象徵咯。月餅嘅歷史咧，就其實係當陣時元朝就統治咗中國，咁中國人咧就想誒、呃、同一時間嘅起義，咁佢哋就諗到用月餅呢個方式咧，就係、是、傳遞消息，就希望所有起義嘅人咧，都要喺唔同嘅地方同一時間都去做起義。食月餅嘅時候，月餅未必係好好味嘅，但係幫你食呢個月餅嘅時候咧，其實就係幫你勾起好多回憶。嗰啲回憶就係你到童年嘅時候，同屋企嗰啲人一齊慶祝中秋節嗰種開心嘅嗰個感覺就會帶到翻嚟啦。Have you ever thought about chocolate as a decorative addition to your Thanksgiving table? Well, Rocky Mountain Chocolate is encouraging you to do just that. And with Halloween coming soon, the season of treats starts now. Well, executive chocolatier Haley Mitchell is at Rocky Mountain's Robson Street store. Haley, hello there. Hi, Gloria. Thanks for having me. So, how do you prepare for this season? Oh, we're doing things a little bit different this year. We do have some new exclusive items, especially for Thanksgiving coming up. We have our limited edition Master Peach. Box, which is just right behind this here, it carries our pumpkin spice caramel. We have chai tea latte bombs, and we have caramel apple toffee bombs as well. Oh, you have to Let open it up. Open it yes, up. Yes, just give yeah, me I one. I'm saying the box is lovely, but uh, <laughs> I need the I need the full visual on that one. And there we are. Oh, that looks gorgeous. It really does. So I. Show us what you have in the way of Thanksgiving apples, because I'm intrigued. What else you've got there on the table? Yeah, so right in front of us here, we have our turkey apples. Our turkey apples are a seasonal apple. We only carry them for a limited time, and we handcraft them in our copper kettle. They take about an hour and a half to make. An hour and a half each? No, <laughs> all of in total. <laughs> oh, I, that's a that's a lot of work that goes into that. It looked like it would be kind of interesting to to eat it as well. <laughs> Just pick, yes, yes, picking out the, the feathers, so to speak, and chewing on those. And take us through the other the other treats you've got there. Yeah, exactly. So we also have ones for Halloween that is also coming up. We have our pumpkin apples, we have our skull apples, and then we have our spiders as well. And these are also just for a limited time as well. Oh, that is so much fun. Now, I'm assuming these are all sweet, just like just like eating a, a candy apple or what what how would you describe the flavors? Yes, so they are very sweet, but we use Granny Smith apples, which is the green ones, to make it a little bit tart as well. So with our sweet caramel, when you bite into it, you get a good mix of it all. So it balances out quite nicely. Oh, lovely. So what else yeah. does this season, you know, inspire you to make? Um, as well, we also have some of our upcoming products as well, like our Halloween ones. Uh, Halloween is going to be a little bit different this year. We might not be tricks, but we definitely still have our treats, and it's definitely a no-brainer with our no-brainer chocolate as well. Your no-brainer, and what's a no-brainer chocolate? So no-brainer chocolates are a uh, pumpkin mold, and it features different candies on the inside. So you can smash it open, and it has a treat inside for everyone. Because <laughs> it has no brains, is that what you're saying? The pumpkin exactly. Has... <laughs> <laughs> I got it. it. Just took a little bit for it for it to click for me there. But what about yeah. you? I mean, what does it take to get into the chocolate making business? Um, definitely, you have to have a really good passion for it. I loved cooking from the beginning in the first place, and it just took off from there. It just well, and how long did it take you to get to where you are? Um, I've been working here for about three years, actually. And at the time, I was not always cooking. And eventually, I saw other great chefs making things, and I said, I want to do it. Okay. Well, food brings such comfort to people. I mean, especially now with COVID nineteen keeping us from so many other comforts. How how would you say food or, or chocolate or what you do? How has it been a comfort to you? Oh, it's definitely been a comfort for me because even though there's not as many people on the streets walking by, there's still people who love to come in and chat with us and watch us do our fun and exciting product making. So it definitely is really good for me to see other people super happy because it's passion for me as well. Okay, well we wish you a sweet Thanksgiving, Haley. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Coming up. New research shows a deep connection between trees and plants and the formation of a certain type of cloud. 
Johanna Wagstaff will explain right after the break. Well, we've known about the processes behind cloud formation for a long time now. Don't ask me to recite the equations, but they are in there somewhere. Clouds form when moist, warm, rising air cools and expands in the atmosphere. The water vapor in the air condenses to form tiny water droplets, which are the basis of clouds. Bada bing, bada boom. But the fine details of how cirrus clouds form, those are the high wispy ones, well, we didn't have a full understanding of until now. And that's because that high up in the atmosphere, gas goes directly into a solid, into ice crystals. And it turns out trees play a more important role than we realized in the formation of these high clouds. And that has huge implications for agricultural, urban development, and climate change modeling. So an international team combined field measurements and lab experiments with cloud theory. We know that particles in the air from smoke and auto emissions influence the creation of these high clouds, providing the nuclei for water vapor or ice crystals to condense onto. For example, contrails behind airplanes form because the exhaust particles help those high clouds form. But this new research spotlights the importance of the emissions from plants and organic material. This data will help us better predict how activities like deforestation or tree planting will affect the world's climate because these organic emissions are playing a bigger role than we realized. As one of the lead authors said, everyone's heard of greenhouse gases and global warming, but not as many people understand that clouds are such a huge player in climate change. In fact, cirrus clouds cover nothing to 25% of Earth, more like 70% in the tropics, and they have a net heat effect of the globe. So if there are more of them, that may be adding sort of an extra blanket to our planet, so to speak. This is an area of research that many climate scientists are concentrating on right now because of the potential for a positive feedback loop. So understanding how they form really is crucial. So now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Well, it is the season to gobble food, and pie is sure prominent on many Thanksgiving menus. Janelle Parsons is the founder of The Pie Hole. Janelle, it's so nice to have you back. Well, thank you for having me back. Now, how busy a time of year is this for you? <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. Um, it's crazy. We are already sold out, but um, we are making pies as fast as we can. Well, sold out of what? What, what are some of the popular items this year? Uh, definitely pumpkin pie, of course. It's the season. Um, apple, we've got a turkey dinner pie. I think a lot of people are opting for that choice for a nice small dinner. Okay, turkey, apple, pumpkin, those kinds of yeah. things. Now, in general, I mean, just the fact that you and I are connected uh, from your store today and you're not here in studio with me, we're doing yeah. things different for, for COVID, of course. How has COVID changed the way that you do business? It's been really different. There's been a lot of adjusting, but um, the customers have been great. My staff have been tremendous. And it's all about just trying to be as safe as possible. Um, we just brought out our own pie hole masks that say cover your pie hole. Um, so it's been fun <laughs> with that anyway, <laughs> okay. um, being able to try and have fun with it. Good. And, and what about uh, for Thanksgiving on your menu this year? What, what's special? Um, well, we've got, and this is one of my absolute favorites, um, every year, it's signature to the pie hole, it's a bourbon pecan pumpkin, um, and I've brought one of those, and uh, what I'll do is put a little drizzle on top, we kind of put a little bit of a bourbon on, so it just is okay. a great flavor with a nutty crunch. Okay, well, let's move in and take a closer yeah. look at that at you want to have pie. a little peek, yes. and then we just kind of have a nice little bourbon glaze, we're just going to kind of drizzle all over there, oh my gosh. Bourbon oh, and yeah. what? It's bourbon and icing sugar. That simple. Just that simple. A little splash of milk, too. A little splash. The bakery's looks a little great. bit cold right now, so it's um, lots of air conditioning going on, but you want to get a nice little <laughs> drizzle. <laughs> That's a nice touch, or I guess you could do individual pieces and just put a little, a little dollop on, yeah, on, on the top of Yeah, then if someone, exactly, if someone doesn't want the booze on there, I feel like it's just the season, but um, you can definitely leave that off. Okay, and what about the pumpkin pie? Do you do anything special with that? Yeah, so I mean, a classic pumpkin pie is best served with whipped cream. So I've brought some, 
and uh, we'll just kind of load this piping bag up and uh, pipe some beautiful rosettes on. If you don't want to do that at home, you can certainly uh, just throw it on the middle and make it kind of rustic. But oh my goodness, my mouth is watering. I'm so sorry that. that you're so far away from me right now. <laughs> I know someone is going to enjoy that pie, and that makes me very happy as well. Now, what that is the be... secret to your great pies? Would you say? Sneak that last oh. in there. Beautiful. Sneak it in, and I like to just do a little sprinkle of cinnamon on top and nutmeg just to kind of finish that little pie off. Oh, lovely. Lovely. And so you were asking me about my secret. What's this? <laughs> well, I know. I know there's I know there's got to be that special touch in there, but what would you say is your, yeah. you know, you have a, a secret ingredient or sort of a certain oh, approach it's with, butter. with your pie making? It is a yeah. lot, a lot of butter. <laughs> and everything is done by hand. So we've already peeled over 4,000 pounds of apples in the bakery, um, and it's just... A a lot of love goes into it. It's a kind of a cheesy ingredient, but it's so true. Oh, that looks so appetizing. You have some vegan yeah. varieties too, don't you? We do actually just right here at the front. We're zooming in on that one. That's a vegan chocolate hazelnut. So it's vegan and gluten free. And um, it's just such a treat. And I love and the size of those too. Apple. It's not yeah. so daunting if you don't want to go for the full <laughs> pie. And I don't know who wouldn't want to go for the big pie, but this way you could have an array and uh, people could ch choose their favorite. That, that, that's an option, well, I guess. Well, definitely. Like, I feel like this is like a COVID friendly option because everything is individual. So you can just kind of grab your own little pie and you don't have to worry about sharing. Um, or they come in a nine pack. They're assorted, all of our Thanksgiving flavors. So you can just have them all to yourself too. Okay, well, it sounds no like judgment. you're already very, very busy <laughs> during COVID and especially around special occasions, but you've had time to put together a cookbook that's coming out next month. Uh, what's I in it? I have, oh my gosh, I just got goosebumps thinking about it. So this is over a hundred of my recipes. It includes our signature double butter crust. Um, this is, oh my gosh, look at that. This is a labor of love and I can't believe that I finally get to see it come to life. And November 17th, you can get one of these. You can pre-order now. And um, if you do pre-order now, you actually can go on our website and put in your confirmation number and get a bundle, which I've included a bunch of these recipes. So you still have time to do that and even make some pie yourself this Thanksgiving. Really impress. That sounds lovely. That yeah. looks tasty all around. Oh Janelle, a very happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Hello, I'm Mike in Yaletown, and this is our Vancouver. If you're looking for events that you can safely attend, the Vancouver Canadians are opening up the prettiest little ballpark in North America for a series of trivia nights at the Nat this month. They happen every Thursday evening in October. You get popcorn and drinks and some fun, and it is for those over the age of 19. Bring your own pens and paper, please. And uh, for more information, go to the Vancouver Canadians website. And Arts Umbrella's annual fundraiser for their arts and theater school is a little different this year. The Splash Art Auction and Gala is going to be held October 24th, and it's going to be a combination of online and in-person experiences. There will be multiple locations at restaurants and private venues allowing for a safe, 50 people to gather with distancing in place. As well, the art is going to be auctioned off digitally. For more information, go to artsumbrella.com. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, here to chat with you about one of the most consistently creative and ambitious musical forces on the Canadian landscape for the past 15 years. I'm talking about Halifax musician, Rich O'Coin. Yeah, that's Richard Coyne capturing one of his legendary live shows in that video for Are You Experiencing? And many people who have experienced Richard Coyne's live show have described it as pure joy. Now, it's almost weird to look at that footage because it doesn't look that COVID safe, but of course, it was another time. Hopefully, we'll get back to uh, when we can all party and sweat 
under a parachute while happily uh, screaming in each other's faces. Rich Coin has also shown a deep appreciation for pop culture. his debut album, We're All Dying to Live, that goes back to 2011. That was Rich Coin's video for It, which features dozens, as you saw there, of recreated scenes from Hollywood movies. Now, almost a decade later, Rich Coin has released a sequel video of sorts. This time, the tireless Halifax musician has reenacted 22 of what he considers to be the most timeless music videos of all time. We'll show you a few, see how many you think you can recognize from this clip from his brand new song called Walls. We can't go through this anymore. It's so much louder than before. It keeps resounding to the core. To the core, to the core, to the core. How could we ever be so sure? To drop a line, heal my soul. Crossed over, always in a wall. In a wall, in a wall. How'd you do? I think I was able to name a couple of those. Be sure to check out the entire video to see how many videos you can pick out that are being characterized. That was Rich Coin with Walls, which is actually a protest song of sorts. Rich feeling that walls do nothing but separate our humanity. It's from Rich Coin's powerful new album, United States, that, in his words, is about the crumbling of an empire that is divided and hurting. Walls by Rich Coin is a song that you need to add to your pandemic playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence, hoping you're staying safe and doing what you can to keep Canadian music alive. Be well, and I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, months into the pandemic, Peace Arch Park continues to give cross-border friends and family a place to connect and they are thankful. Hello, you are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, Thanksgiving weekend has many of you no doubt thinking of family and dear friends. Uh, well, the pandemic has kept a lot of people apart, including many in the U.S. who aren't allowed to visit friends and family here. But for the past months since the border has been closed, Peace Arch Park has been a haven for so many people. Ian Hannah Mansing reports. Uh, this is cross-border love in the time of COVID, a story of romance growing through a loophole in the U.S.-Canada border ban. Okay. Linton Harris is a Canadian, Julie Arps, American. They connected on a dating site in April during the pandemic. So you had a good day? Yeah, it was busy. Unable to cross the border, though they live just a short drive apart, Julie and Linton spent a lot of time on their computers until they found out they could meet here. And that's when online became in love. After the first few couple of weeks or so, I was kind of... I fell in love with her, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> and I knew that she was the one I wanted to, to have, so... And I fell in love with him within the first couple of weeks as well. It just, it happened so, so, so fast. And we just spent, spent hours, you know, talking about our lives and our families and everything. On the map, it's black and white. This park is in the United States, but in practice, it's a shade of gray. U.S. Border Patrol allows Canadians to enter the park freely. 
and when they cross the ditch to go back to Canada, the RCMP simply makes sure they're Canadian residents and not carrying contraband. This makeshift international zone is no secret. Even on what regulars told me was a slow day, there are lots of couples, families, friends from each side of the border getting together. Or wishing they could. Kaylin Ball lives just a few blocks away. Her fiancé, Dave, lives in Baltimore. They met long before the pandemic and made those long flights back and forth. Yeah, so this was on our first date. We went to the Baltimore Aquarium. We just had like the best first date ever. (laughs) CBC was there back in July when they got together in the park. Yeah, I'll travel across the country and sit in a park for three or four days just to be with you. Under the new rules announced Friday, long-term couples can get together in Canada, but that still requires a 14-day quarantine. And back in July, Kaylin and Dave weren't sure when that might happen. It was really hard to say goodbye after that. Well, I was going to say, what was the goodbye like? Lots of crying. (laughs) Of course, the rules about not crossing the border freely have to do with reducing the spread of COVID. And so we asked people here about that. They say that whether it's maintaining their distance in the park or keeping within small bubbles, they can meet here and do it safely. Both of us are very careful in our bubbles, in our own communities, and I only see my immediate family, sons and my dad. My company, we've kind of split shifts, so I basically work by myself and I'm I don't think I could be more careful than I am now. And apart from Julie, I don't meet anyone else. We asked the federal health authorities about this quirky exception, but they said, ask the RCMP. The Mounties consider their role here security, checking IDs and bags. And so this park is where family and friendship has somehow prevailed over the usually stark border rules. So when you look around here, and I I know you don't know the people who are here, but as you look at these groups of people, what do you think is going on? You know, I think so many people have lost hope or have been a little crushed during the pandemic in some way. And for many people, this park is, is their one hope and their one chance to see the people that they love the most. And, you know, I think that's a really special thing in times when there's not a lot of good news. Sunset means long goodbyes. It's when the park closes and that keeps getting earlier. As Julie and Linton waved goodnight, they plan to meet again in a couple of days and wonder when they'll be able to go home together. Now, Ransford Brempong made his name on the basketball court, but he leans on spoken word poetry as an intellectual and creative outlet. The 39-year-old spent last summer with the Fraser Valley Bandits after a lengthy career in Europe and with the Canadian national team. And now Brempong is encouraging other Canadian elite basketball league players to use their platform to create positive messages to inspire fellow Canadians to use their voice. When our pounds got raised, when our pounds got raised, those were the days we were living in the haze, got woke in the malaise of COVID-19 and happier days. Many thought it was a phase. No clue they were living back then so close to the blaze. So we moved forward then we gazed at those who stayed back and rather grazed, too lost in a systematic maze. In shock that the perfect bubble might get tased. Weren't racist, but their hands of privilege wasn't raised. While Trudeau came through and gave praise, it was a physical manifestation of 21 seconds of silence. Long enough to feel the violence, at the same time to recognize the science, to beat systematic oppressions, lambs will have to be silenced. Heavenly Father, please give us a sign, please give us some guidance. When our pounds got raised, those were the days. BLM was a phrase, blessed by all creeds and color. When you witness a lynching for almost nine minutes, it'll make you suffer. It'll make you suffer. He muttered, then he stuttered, then cried for his mother. There was no other that could give him life. For the melanin, he shouldn't have to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Make the change. My only tangible advice, make the change to save your life. Make the change. Like Saul to Paul, a leper before the call, I'm salt of the earth baptized before the fall, I'm falling, I'm all in, I'm calling, Kaepernick, Neil, we all win, the movement of the spirit always comes from within, the heavens sing, 
Won the battle well before we had entered the ring. The heavens sing, Ali, boom, bye, Black man, black man, live to breathe another day. Or die as a peasant with nothing to say. Born king, don't let them con you like they tried to con Ye. Cause every day we stay, oh so cliche. Don't let them lead you astray. Stay suppressed, but no longer play. For when our pounds got raised, we no longer sway. a Vancouver-based company that doesn't demolish homes. It deconstructs them so the materials can be salvaged. The problem is it can take weeks to take apart an old home by hand. But the CEO has figured out how to use a crane to drastically speed up the process. So he invited us along to a job site in Vancouver's Carisdale neighborhood to show us just how it works. I launched this company in January 2018. We were building houses on the west side, uh, energy efficient homes using a lot of reclaimed materials and we had a reclaimed wood shop. We just saw houses, every other house getting demolished around us. I knew the value of that lumber because uh, this is all old growth Douglas fir lumber that's in these old houses um, and it just it was driving me crazy to see them just being demolished, all that material going to landfill or to the incinerator. Really up until the 1970s we were framing our old buildings with old growth Douglas fir. So this is the big old trees that we have very few of and we no longer cut them, thankfully, for dimensional lumber. Um, so this is basically a, ra a rare resource. Every demolition makes it even more scarce, and we're recovering that. So the only place you can find old growth dimensional lumber is locked behind the walls of our buildings. As development continues to increase, that means more and more houses and buildings are demolished, and less and less of this wood is available. So it's, it is really the heartbeat of our business. So we've talked about bringing a crane on site to help pull the, the building apart in pieces for about four years. Um, so this is basically four years in the making. Um, the big thing is, much like prefabricated construction, having a lot of the time and work done off-site, and then the build happen, happening really quickly, uh, we're, we're the reverse of that. We're trying to get this building off-site as quick as possible so that the builder can move forward with the construction, and then we'll do the dismantling, denailing off-site. In the next few years, you're likely going to see the city mandating deconstruction on up to 700 homes per year. We want to make sure that we can capture a significant portion of those. Um, we're the only ones doing what we do right now in the city, in the country actually. Uh, so we, we know we're leading the charge and we want to make sure that we can do the volume that's going to be coming our way. Coming up, decades of history and beautiful baking are coming to an end as a much loved Chinatown shop sets to close. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, an iconic restaurant in Vancouver's Chinatown is shutting its doors. After more than three decades in business, Goldstone Bakery won't be reopening, even after the pandemic. And the concern is many other businesses in the historic neighborhood are facing the same fate. Leanne Young explains. As a restaurateur, Ray Loy gets how hard it's been to manage a business amid the pandemic. The latest casualty, one of his childhood favorites, Goldstone Bakery and Restaurant. To hear that they're closing is just not, not very good news at all. He remembers weekly visits with mom as a six-year-old after a visit to the Woodward's toy department. We would have, you know, an old school uh, baked pork, ch pork chop on rice, which is a Hong Kong style cafe staple, and have Hong Kong milk tea. And uh, that was probably one of my fondest memories to have that uh, meal at Goldstone. Not much has changed over three decades at Goldstone, not the menu or even prices, but the number of patrons has shrunk dramatically, much like the rest of Chinatown. The ongoing struggle has forced the owners to sell and hopefully downsize. I'm very sad, you know, because this is a real landmark for the current gathering of all people in Chinatown. 
Richard Wong says the restaurant is still beloved as a community hub, stemming from its heydays in the late 1980s, when this was the spot for a new wave of Hong Kong immigrants and their families. It reflects the economy in Chinatown is deteriorating to the level that even such of a popular place cannot survive. So that is a serious matter. Wong is worried the pandemic is the last nail in the coffin, a shared concern for many of the businesses in the area. He believes more development is the solution to attract consumers with spending power, but there are concerns over affordability. In the meantime, community groups are pleading for emergency measures. How do we remove barriers um, to accessing Chinatown? And what that means is um, in terms of uh, parking, uh, foot traffic, uh, how do people make people feel safe? Removing fees, increasing patrols and emergency funding are all part of the group's request to all three levels of government. Support they say that's critical to a neighborhood on the brink. Hopefully the government steps in to help them because this pandemic might be a last blow to them and if they don't receive any help, they might be gone forever. The hope is Goldstone may one day reopen, but like Chinatown, its future remains uncertain. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, it's time to go back into our CBC archives, and we are going way back today. In 1960, there was a provincial election on, and many of the same issues raised then are still important today. Just watch. This is Norman Depot in British Columbia, where most of the forest fires are out, but a provincial election campaign is burning furiously. Good afternoon. Just eight days from now, 900,000 voters in British Columbia go to the polls to make a decision which has implications for all of us. Norman Depoe has been in the province where, incidentally, he and I both grew up. Norman, what are your findings? Sam, there are two things you can say about this election right away. First of all, there's a bigger undecided vote, and as a result, more interest in the campaign than there's been for years. And second, it's unlike any of the provincial elections we've seen so far in 1960. For instance, in Saskatchewan, the medical care issue dominated everything else. And in Quebec, it simply boiled down to charges of corruption against national union. Here, there are at least a score of issues, all of them important to the people of B.C., and many of them important to people right across Canada. But first, let's get the facts on the record. The old grey stone and gingerbread of the legislature buildings looking out over the placid inner harbour in Victoria have seen a lot of governments come and go. Liberals, conservatives, then a coalition that came within one seat of falling to the CCF and finally since 1952, social credit. It's a huge and a varied province, 366,000 square miles of it, thousands of miles of seacoast, rich fisheries, almost limitless forests, the fertile farms of the river valleys, the famous orchards of the Okanagan, minerals, exciting new discoveries of oil and natural gas in the north. And everywhere you look is the spectacular mountain scenery, the game-packed woods, the lakes filled with trout that draw thousands of tourists every year. It's a province that seems to have everything, and on the surface, as the tourist sees it, it's a prosperous one. Well, here are some of the images captured this week by our still photographer, Ben Nelms. His award-winning eye brings us so much here at CBC Vancouver. Take a look. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you'll join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Goodbye for now.